Good morning. Uh, this is going to be chapter three, Diagnostic Resources. And this is the last of uh, the first section of the book, which is looking at vocabulary and now really a basic tools used uh, to diagnose disease and treatment. And then the next section is a couple of chapters where we will look at basic disease processes that work for all the rest of the, of the class. And then the bulk of the class will be going through all the systems. So let's begin. All right, that is it's like a big MRI machine right there. Uh, so indeed, let's look at the, the outline of this chapter. So we'll talk about, first of all, patient care, looking at if you're symptomatic means you came because you have symptoms, you have, a, have an issue, right? Asymptomatic is we're gonna try to screen and find uh, problems before you show any symptoms. And then even better than that would be to um, not get the disease in the first place. So look at preventative measures. And then the bulk of this uh, talk today would we'll talk about um, the different procedures, um, both radiologic, x-rays, and MRI, CT scans, and then uh, look at different uh, uh, samples that can be sent to the lab and, and uh, even get to the end where we're looking at uh, molecular diagnosis. So that's the plan. So first of all, symptomatic disease means you're coming because you have a, an issue, you come into the, to the doctor. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is take a detailed history it's where you talk to the patient and you get some information. And as I mentioned before, people lie, but hopefully you take the information and uh, you work with it, but keeping that in mind, of course. And a physical examination, you're going to do some basic things uh, that um, will rule out, you know, will, will give you an idea if there's, a, there's an issue, with, if you have problems with some of these uh, tests. And so the history, they'll talk about, um, you know, when did you first uh, have this symptom? Has it gotten worse? Has it gotten better? And uh, this will be helpful to seeing the course of the disease and diagnosing the disease. So obviously you look at a person and you can tell some things uh, right away. Are they yellow? Are they jaundiced? Are they limping? You know, are they able to speak? Uh, are their eyes following you? All these things are... Uh, will be immediately apparent um, by looking at them. And then you can do some more specialized tests, but you were not even that specialized yet. So um, uh, first of all is uh, when you hear auscultation, it means listening. So use a stethoscope and uh, you can listen to uh, heart sounds. You could catch a murmur, valve problems. You can listen to breathing. You know, put it in many places in the chest and you'll hear uh, you want to hear a smoothness, but if you hear kind of a rubbing, a roughness, it means you could have pleural membranes could be rubbing and show uh, an issue there. Uh, percussion, sounds like instruments, is, is, is tapping, exactly what it is. And uh, in that case, you can look at um, the hollowness of, a, of an organ, how it sounds. Does it sound um, dull or does it, there's going to be a difference in the quality of the sound. So you, you can tap on the chest in this patient and it would sound different in areas where there's air, and then if it's filled with fluid, it's gonna sound different. So you can tell some things right away. So that uh, would be percussion. And then uh, palpation is, is feeling, is using your hands. And so you can palpate, you can do a breast exam, you can look at, palpate the abdomen, look for masses. Uh, if the liver is in, or spleen is enlarged, you can tell that. You can palpate a joint to see if it's swollen or if there's any abnormalities, so putting your hands on the patient to, uh, to learn some things. Some tools, I did not put a picture of a stethoscope. If you don't know what a stethoscope is, that's, that's gonna be an issue. Um, but an otoscope, when you hear that, you think ear. And so uh, that will give you a view like this. And they're ah, oh, this, this kid's got tubes in the ear to, to drain a middle ear infection. So uh, otoscope, real quickly, be able to see if there's, there's wax buildup or inflammation of the tympanic membrane, things like that. Um, ophthalmoscope is when you take a look uh, in the eye. 
And here you can see, you'd be able to see the retina and I look at the blood vessels uh, and you can look at if there's any other issues in there. So that's a real quick way to take a look at that. Obviously, if you see a serious problem, um, you want them to go to ophthalmologist. And then a uh, vaginal speculum allows you to look in there and see the cervix deep within there. I didn't put a picture there, but you can imagine. And then um, possibly uh, at that point, you've got some clues and uh, you want to supplement your basic uh, uh, test that you did. And so you can get some special procedures if necessary. Um, they can, uh, like I say, maybe you need to take a biopsy if you feel a lump or uh, maybe they give you a history of having blood in the stool. Maybe say, oh, you should have your sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy and take a look at that. And so you can order these things or order radiological tests. We'll talk about those. Um, they have a suspect a broken bone or soft tissue issue, injuries in, in, in a joint, definitely. Or order some laboratory tests. And some of these are just done routinely. Uh, if, if you're looking, following someone's uh, blood cholesterol or, or something like that. Um, and you can use urine or blood looking drug test, pregnancy test. Uh, um, yeah, all kinds of things you can learn from um, looking at a, a, a chemical test of blood or urine. So this approach, and people come in when they have symptoms, is uh, good for acute conditions. Uh, you got a broken bone and you have a cold. So you come in, you can, you can talk about the symptoms, you can do some tests, hopefully quickly diagnose it and get them on a treatment plan. Um, what's important here in these, uh, in looking for, um, when talking to patients is hopefully catch chronic diseases early. Um, really nice. I think like hypertension, you walk around, you don't know you have high blood pressure. Um, but if you test regularly, it's cheap, it's quick, it's easy, you would be able to catch this very common uh, issue and it'll prevent down the road things like a stroke and, and other vascular diseases, right? Diabetes, again, you, uh, if you catch it early, early on, you'll be able to, to then follow this and be able to hopefully um, manage it so it doesn't cause bigger problems and cancers too. If you can catch a lump, early on or a skin, um, an unusual mole. I mean, your prognosis is so much better. So this is all about, you know, getting regular checkups. Why it's important is because you catch these chronic diseases, which are slow growing early on. It's much cheaper, much better prognosis. Uh, what they're showing here is a um, looking at an ultrasound of a carotid artery. So here's a screening possibly to see um, if there's atherosclerosis uh, there. So this screening, this idea of screening is looking for diseases that before you have symptoms. And so I, I mentioned looking at uh, blockage of your carotid arteries. You could catch if there's a risk of a stroke. Um, this machine here is a bone scanning machine because osteoporosis, your first symptom is probably going to be a broken hip or a broken wrist, something like that. And if you can uh, uh, not, not have to go through months and months of rehab and pain um, by uh, learning early on, you have osteoporosis much better for all these things. So to diagnose uh, diseases early in these early stages, you need regular uh, medical appointments. And as I've talked about, some people don't have this option. They, they don't have insurance. They, you know, they can't afford to just, a, I'm gonna pay out of pocket to go get a, uh, a checkup, you know, for no reason. Fe you know, people are not going to do that. Regular dental appointments, my goodness, yeah, you, people will come in uh, to a dental clinic way beyond any chance of saving the teeth, right? Um, and whether if they, if they had gotten, you know, that cavity uh, filled early and cheaply, it would be much cheaper than having to pull the tooth and any chance of the expense of a dental implant, things like that. But um, definitely get your, uh, uh, baby in there early, get the checkup, get the important information you need, and the regular exams will catch uh, diseases early. That's the point of regular going for a checkup is uh, being able to catch these things early and to have discussions to even prevent them, right? Yeah, so these are screenings. Um, some things are easy to screen for, like hypertension, and other things like this 
bone density scan are expensive and time consuming and you're not going to do it for everyone you're going to do it for people that are at a certain risk yeah so first of all um family history so important your genetics so we find out have such an important influence on on many many diseases right and uh even genetics and your environments you know if you grow up living next to a nuclear power plant something like that it's probably important information to know um and then you ask some uncomfortable questions you know do you use drugs uh and if you're having unprotected sex with many partners maybe you should get a sti uh, uh panel um ask you how many drinks a week you have and you may think it's normal to have you know a six pack a day but it's going to be more alarming to a health professional that may uh, want to look uh, further so taking this history is going to be a first step to delving deeper into maybe where you should be where their their lifestyle is causing and history are causing a higher probability of a certain disease we well, can go there you can look pinpoint it instead you can't screen for everything and the physical examination sure in the dental setting you know take a look uh, around the all the teeth the gums gives you a chance to also look for uh, cancer in the mouth as well uh, breast exam i mean if you catch uh, a lump early you're you can quickly get a biopsy until if you wait it's too late it's going to spread so there's a time component so earlier you catch these things and unusual moles they can uh, do a biopsy of that take a look see what it looks like and you know catch those things early and yeah reflexes again you get a hit you on the knee with a hammer right and uh most of the time you kick and they go on but if you have an unusual reaction that's you know could be a clue to an early neurological disease and i'll try it again you know and to see if it to elicit that same response and if they do find a problem then you you're sent for further testing and that could catch something uh, real early a neurological problem and then of course uh, we'll talk about this this pap test is, is great for catching cervical cancer early early and mammograms they're just um in a society where you have health care they're just uh we know a certain risk of having breast cancer increases in certain years and we just this is a routine kind of exam like a colonoscopy we know from our data that um people get colon cancer really probability goes up in the later age in your 50s and so we just say this is what's recommended if you have health care and you can it's available and it's from your book you can take a look at, at all these uh these uh screening things definitely so i take a look at my my lipids see how my cholesterol is doing um sure dental x-rays are done regularly because you can you can catch uh, caries or cavities early mammograms ear tests uh colon cancer yeah some of these things too like the prostate cancer and colon cancer um sure you can do an invasive um prostate exam or a colonoscopy but we're getting better and better tools you can just get a fecal sample and uh look in there for the cancer cells that will be come with the, the feces as it comes down or look at your blood for psa prostate specific antigen um uh, people with prostate cancer have that and you can have you know false tests etc but um it's a real much quicker way um than having your prostate manipulated and you could even miss something there so we can't screen everyone for everything at this point because of the cost and you know the logistics so the likelihood of the way we figure out who should get screened is based on risk factors and this is from data collected on populations to figure out who needs uh, to be screened for what and is it available and you know very apropos today looking at you know if we had a, a test for for covid we could test everyone every day we could quickly figure out who has it and it shut it down um yeah um this could works for a lot of things looking at uh yeah all kinds of things if the availability was there and the cost was was cheap we could have a great handle on all kinds of communicable diseases but the cost definitely look at you know for screening for hypertension involves just a sphygmal mammometer and it involves our blood pressure cuff so we can really quickly go to the drugstore and get that um screening 
getting an MRI test is thousands of dollars. So these things are, 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 um, are not just thrown out like candy, you know, like get, get an MRI. So you need to really have a, a pretty good reason. So the cost, the availability, and uh, looking at the patient, you know, what is the probability they're gonna have this? You know, uh, men get breast cancer, like just 1% of breast cancers. And so it's obviously you wanna put your resources to testing uh, women in that, for that disease. And these screening procedures, um, you've already got the disease, you're just catching it early. So you can see it's reactive, not proactive. Ideally, you wanna look at lifestyle and uh, everything you can do to prevent the disease from even starting. But this PAP test, looking at this is, uh, we do this in America and other countries, and you can compare where it's done to where it's not done. And it makes a huge difference in deaths from cervical cancer. It's just this regular testing. And uh, if they can scrape some cells off the cervix and catch early on cancerous cells, um, then they can go and remove a piece or do what they need to do to, to stop it. If not, it sits there year after year and it, can, it spreads and can cause a death. And potential disease is looking at prevention. And so uh, if you're looking at periodontal disease, how about regular uh, teeth cleanings, right? Regular screenings. Um, uh, smallpox, well, you're not gonna get smallpox now because we got rid of that, but um, other diseases, uh, hand washing and uh, not being around people with diseases and covering your your mouth when you cough yeah and vaccines talk about that next and so looking at that here's the here was measles and look at measles killed almost not killed but people a million cases hundreds of thousands of cases in the 50s and 60s and then we came up with the vaccine we can see brought it down now it should be eradicated there should be no cases of measles except that we have people that are not vaccinated. And you see, we figured out there were still some cases and it, we determined, oh, okay, a second dose in the, in the 80s, uh, that is really even better. And so we've, we've gotten better at it. And looking uh, pre-vaccine versus, you know, currently, you can see how successful we are. You know, tetanus, you know, we got a vaccine, you got a vaccine for tetanus. And, now there's a few people that, that get it. it's a horrible disease if you get it it's um, yeah painful and, and very deadly but most people get tetanus shots and so um, we've we've kind of gotten rid of that uh, rabies for dogs um, and look at mumps measles diphtheria pertussis is whooping cough <clears throat> and smallpox has was a huge killer look at pictures of people with smallpox and um, horrible disease horrible killer uh, around the world. It's what it gave smallpox infected blankets to Native Americans, one of the saddest stories of you know, human history. Um, and then uh, we've eradicated it from the earth. We believe it still exists in some vials in the CDC and Russia, but it's because now people are not, uh, um, people are not naturally, um, they're vulnerable to it now because no one has had smallpox for so long that it could be a bioweapon anyway, it's kind of interesting. Um, and then polio, uh, it's almost eradicated from the earth. There's just a few countries where it's left because uh, of uh, vaccines. It used to be in the summers in the 50s, both my stepdad and my mom had polio early on. You, you would, if a kid got a cough, you're like, oh my God, this kid's gonna end up dying or in a, uh, an iron lung or um, um, uh, having other issues, so. Um, it, uh vaccine is a huge success story with that too. But just real quickly, realize that these are preventable diseases here. These are, this is, uh, you can see uh, the red is uh, measles. And you can see here in Maine, a measles outbreak, whooping cough coming back because people, especially it's kind of an American thing are being anti-vaccine. They think this uh, Andrew Wakefield came up with a paper, turned out to be crap and that he, he was being, he had money involved and it's, he falsified data, but it came out saying the MMR vaccine is linked to autism. And now so many studies, an incredible amount, hundreds of thousands of people in these studies have shown, no, there's zero link between the MMR vaccine and autism, but still, people still believe it. Um, you can read stuff on the internet. It's, it's, it's really sad. And Maine was up there in the top, um, up at the top of kindergartners 
getting exemptions for not getting vaccines. And that's when it gets dangerous. If you have over 95% of people vaccinated, the disease has nowhere to go. But when that starts dropping, 94, 93, it pops up. And uh, uh, that's a big issue. All right, so vaccination, of course, great way to prevent disease, right? You get your MMR, you're not gonna get mumps, measles, or rubella. I say you're not going to, there's a very little chance. It definitely helps. And other vaccines like the flu vaccine are helpful, but they're not 100% because there's so many different strains. And we can't really get into it, but you know, why don't we have a vaccine for the common cold or HIV? And some diseases are constantly changing so, uh, and mutating. So it's really hard to make a vaccine specific to them, but that, that's a whole lecture. Um, yes, and of course, uh, a lot of diseases can be cured by, um, not cured, but less likely to get it by lifestyle changes. Smoking is a, causes a laundry list of cancers and, and, and other issues, um, definitely. Um, and diet, obesity uh, also is going to throw in a risk factor for so many other diseases too. And a lot of the stopping of diseases have been public health improvements, uh, is having clean water. Um, uh, even fluoride in our drinking water has probably prevented a bunch of caries in, in our population. So we do things publicly, not wearing a seatbelt is going to cause a lot less death as well. So we do things in the public interest to try to, to save lives. And make sure you all know the term epidemiology. This is people that study disease, looking at in both spatially and temporally how, uh, who gets it, how it's transmitted. And this is really big now with COVID. People, these people are very, very important in tracking disease and, and giving us the best information on how to not, uh, not keep spreading a disease. So epidemiology is the study of disease uh, in, in, in populations, how it behaves. And so these uh, things are only effective if they're used. Uh, vaccines, uh, you're not gonna get mumps if you get the, the mump vaccine, but you know, if you decide I don't wanna get it because I read something on the internet that's gonna uh, kill me, then um, kill my kid actually, you're, you're in charge of your kid, um, then it's not gonna be uh, uh, very helpful. And a lot of people, these preventative services, if you don't have dental insurance or health insurance, then it's just not available. And there's other people, the mindset that they only go to the doctor if they feel sick. And by that time, you know, you've cut out all that wonderful ability to screen, right? For high blood pressure and for, for cancer, all these things. And so it's the mindset of some people as well as the, the financial situation, which is most likely. Because when you give people insurance, they tend to be smart enough to know, you know, I can get this this these screenings i can go see the doctor and dentist so um, public health these workers they they go out some of you will go out and look for populations of people that are underserved and that that's that, that could benefit so much from um from from health care um, even looking at maine and northern maine you know there's not that many dental clinics and not that many there's no big hospitals and so um yeah those people have issues of long travel times and sometimes not the financial resources to, to have good health health care. All right, let's switch gears and start talking about um, some tests and such, the common things that, uh, um, that are done in order for us to diagnose a person. So a test is something, it's you take a sample from a patient and you, you do a test on it, you figure that out. And a procedure is something that you will do, um, and maybe an additional procedure. Uh, sometimes it's to get that sample, like a biopsy or uh, an additional procedure. So you need a procedure done, a test, thinking about those are. And uh, some common ones, of course, that all healthcare practitioners can do is, is uh, take a urine sample, a blood sample, a throat culture, you know, all these things um, um, can be done and they're sent out to a lab uh, for pathologist uh, to test. Analyze, yep. And the more specialized tests, showing a colonoscopy here, or um, things that need expensive machines, or you need people, maybe send them to a neurologist if they, 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 they show neuro neurological problems, people that really specialize in this or have specialized equipment. So you'll uh, send them to these people if you can't do the basic tests that, with what you have. So radiologically, 
this is uh these are things i mean the x-ray was what we had at one point and it was an amazing thing because you don't have to cut a person open to look at their bones you can just magically see through their skin right um so x-rays uh, use radiation well i'll show you that and then a ct scan is uh, x-rays that are done uh, many many images and a computer puts them together so very very cool and then an mri we'll talk about that magnetic resonance imagery uses magnets radio waves to uh to look at inside your body ultrasound uses high frequency sound waves and they reflect back awesome and then if you're going to get a pet scan that's nuclear medicines using radioactivity they put it in your body and then um they do a scan for radioactivity to see where that uh, material went and that can tell you where uh, tumors are and things like that yeah when you see with contrast many of you are familiar with that you can put a contrast um liquid so it's always a liquid like barium that uh is going to be um stop the the the, the x-ray or the, the radio waves or it's going to be something that maybe let's say you want to take get an enema when they put uh, barium up your colon that ends and it's going to you take an image and it's going to uh, sh really light that up it's going to show every little nook and cranny like that uh, maybe they want to put contrast in an artery and then they can follow the path of the artery when you take a look at an image of it so you see with contrast or or uh, without contrast mammograms yep ct scan urogram will be in the urinary tract arteriogram they can do that to look at your the coronary arteries on your heart so they can figure out how the blockage and what percentage blocked it is yeah so what mri awesome machine ultrasound and then nuclear scans all right yeah so let's begin with the x-ray um this is the first x-ray here it's his wife took an x-ray of it these early uh madame curie these early scientists studying radiation they almost always got cancer and died. It's it, we, before we knew some of the um, uh, these the great uh, dangers here. But look at that X-ray. How cool is that? Be able to look right through there. And uh, when you see an X-ray, what you're seeing is that uh, 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 is the X-ray goes through the tissue and then it hits. Used to be film. Now it's just a, a screen, but beneath it, and it shows you places that are more opaque or more translucent. Um, the, the white versus the dark and it is uh, the white is going to show where it's a shadow where it's it's the x-rays can't make it through and the dark something like air is where the x-ray makes it through yep and now with contrast you can put contrast in there to delineate a, a space usually a stomach a gallbladder a colon and we use computers now to able to make all these x-rays and put it all together three-dimensionally awesome yeah, so looking at this chest x-ray, uh, where you see the darkness is going to be where the x-ray can go right through because there's lots of air in there. It's very easy. Where you see the white, that's where the x-rays are stopped. And then the screen behind it doesn't get hit with those x-rays. So you get this, this contrast of the whites and the darks. Beautiful. Radio dense material leaves a white shadow. Got it? And I'll show you a fluoroscope. In this case, you can put um, some um, radio opaque uh, dye, some contrast solution, and you can get a, uh, behind it, you can uh, um, get a screen that's going to catch the x-rays and you can get this, this video. So I'll show you that, let's see. That's awesome, hope you can see that. Here it is, you swallow it, there it is. Oh, and you can see if there's a, a constriction in the esophagus things like that so very very cool not sure how much x-ray uh, radiation you get if it's dangerous or not because we know x-rays can't be so routine um, because x-rays damage cells dna cause cancer so we try to limit the number of x-rays uh, a person gets so ct ct scan is a whole bunch of x-rays done at different angles and you can computer puts these images together and this beautiful um, um, uh, images you can like go through all these layers of the body um, it's the gold standard it's what's used when they look at you go in maybe you have a, a cerebral hemorrhage or an aneurysm in there they can do a ct scan take a look at it and this picture here shows a, um, intracranial hemorrhage probably a subdermal hematoma uh, looking at darkness there is the blood that is gathered 
And so they can quickly see that, realize they can, they can drill a hole, release that pressure probably. Yeah, so there's a big CT scanner. Um, and also deep seated things. I want to get deep like a kidney or a pancreas tumor. I want to get you know, deep in there. The x-rays will get in there and show that nicely. And then an MRI. And I've got an MRI for my back. I had some back issues. And this is uh, safer than a CT because it doesn't use x-rays. It uses these huge magnets that go around and then they shoot. Uh, the magnets will cause all the protons. We're made mostly of water. So all these hydrogen ions will, will line up quickly. And then when they snap back, um, you can record the radio waves that come off of that. So different density of tissues are going to show uh, the more water in a tissue will show uh, up differently on the screen that is capturing um, the emitted radio waves. So it uses magnets. It's really loud because when you, you hit the magnets, it causes these vibrations and these huge coils in there. And so it's claustrophobic and loud. And so it's some, they sedate some people when they do this. Um, but again, it's not dangerous. You can use it for a baby and a, a human because it's just using magnets, not uh, radiation. Yeah, you can't use it if you have any metal whatsoever. And if you had a piercing or a, or a, um, a plate in your leg or something like that, it'd be incredibly painful because the magnets are gonna, gonna heat that up real quickly. So you're not gonna be wearing a watch in, a, in an MRI. Yeah. I just, I, threw, I found some uh, MRI images uh, last night looking at that. Look at that, beautiful, showing all the soft tissue. Oh. Here's a mother and child or an MRI. Oh, look at that arteriogram looking at the, uh, the arteries in the brain. They put contrast in so you could see. And then we have something called functional MRI, fMRI. And in this case, this is a huge, huge tool that is causing us to learn so much is that the ability to take video in there of MRI of uh, while the patient is performing tasks or thinking about things. So it's gonna be the new lie detector test. Instead of you know, crudely measuring you know, your, your pulse rate and your breathing rate, you'll be able to look at the brain and see what parts light up when you answer questions. That's absolutely gonna happen. And so um, you can look at uh, people with brain issues or Alzheimer's and such, and you can um, see what parts of their brain light up in certain activities or certain thoughts. You can show them pictures or video while they're in there or headphones. So amazing, amazing uh, ability to measure. This measures where the blood is flowing in the brain at a particular time, I meaning which part of the brain is being used. And they can use functional MRI too, looking at heart valves and flow of blood through the heart. So you see these bright colors, it's colorized. Yeah. Ultrasound. I looked up, you can buy these things for a couple hundred bucks. You get an ultrasound, a little portable machine. And some of these are portable with a battery pack. And uh, that's cool using it in the field or anywhere. At home, you can get this, look at, look at little baby. Um, so this thing, uh, they usually put some gel on and they use the ultrasound to, to, to shoot sound waves and they'll, they'll bounce back. It's really good for uh, like, uh, gallbladders, bladders, uh, looking at a uterus filled with the fluid, uh, um, solid, um, Barrier is particularly good at bouncing the sound waves back, but uh, it, the picture is not, you know, it's not an MRI or anything, but it's really quickly and it's very safe because you're just using sound waves to, to, to take a look at the, at the fetus or take a look at a, at a gallbladder. And lastly, this is not used that often, very expensive, very dangerous, you need a lot of specialized training, where they're going to put radioactive material in you and uh, that radioactive, maybe you're gonna, um, well, you could put radioactive uh, carbon in a glucose molecule and then see where it's taken up. And it turns out that cancer cells use more glycolysis than aerobic respiration because there's less blood flow and so they use that. And so we can look for glycolic enzymes and see they will light up in areas where there's, there's cancer or um, we can see real active tissue is gonna be using that glucose. And so that's where it's gonna go and you can take a look at that. But many uh, radioactive um, um, isotopes can be given, and then you can do a scan and look for the emitted radiation. So again, dangerous, expensive, um, but you know, useful. It's called a, a PET scan. Uh, I can't use that term next, but uh, 
here it shows yeah, your PET scan right here, positive emission tomography, something like that, positron emission tomography. But you can see here's a CT scan, right? And uh, here's the PET scan. They can combine those. You have this beautiful image. So where that lights up, they know there's an issue there. So it gives you some specific areas. And I just found this just, you can imagine you're going in for a PET scan. They don't want you to eat or drink. And then uh, 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 they will uh, uh, put that radioactive material in you. And then you wait a certain amount of time to whatever they want to see what's going to happen to that material. And then they will, will scan and see where that material went in your body. All right. So x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, ultrasound. These are all tools and they're, they're in the, the toolkit of the clinician to decide which one is best suited and sometimes the best monetary um, deal uh, to, to figure out what you need to figure out and what's available in your, in your, your hospital. It may take a long waiting list again to the MRI, it might be quicker to do another one. So the, all these things are weight. All right, we'll look at some um, other tests that'll be done. So anatomic pathology tests. Um, so surgical pathologists, they will, um, let's say a person is getting a uh, skin, some cancer removed from a piece of skin and they will um, uh, be in surgery. They will remove as little as possible, of course, because they don't want to you know, remove a huge chunk. And then they'll send that down to the uh, histology lab and even while the surgery is going on, they can make a quick section. They can do a frozen section, slice it, look in the microscope, and they look at the edges. They say, did, did you get it all? And they'll come back and say, no, no, on the buccal side or the posterior part, they, there's still some that they'll be able to, to do that in real time. So surgical pathology takes pieces of tissue, runs it to the lab, and they will um, um, do gross examination. They can look at it or do microscopic histological examination and be able to, uh, to give um, guidance. So when you hear biopsy, a biopsy means you're taking a piece of tissue uh, for study. So let's say you suspect glomerular nephritis or a kidney problem. Well, you can put a needle into the kidney, take out a small section and look at a microscope and stain it and be able to see what's going on often. So instead of having to take the old organ out or, 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 or get in there, you can just use a needle just to take a small sample. So here you can see they're using ultrasound to guide them to put a, a needle into the thyroid gland to see if this nodule, they can see if is it cancerous, is it benign, do they need to, what's their next step? So needle biopsy, take a small piece. Excisional, you need to excise, take a piece right there. You hear the term resection, they're gonna resect it. That's when you take, you just take a piece out. Resect the bladder or something like that, take a piece out like that. And um, like I say, I, when you're going to get a biopsy, when you get a tissue sample, it takes days and weeks to, to make a nice slide. They, uh, yeah, they, they embed it in wax, they use a microtone to make thin sections, they remove the wax, they put different stains on, they put it in different grades of alcohol, they put a cover slip, and then you've got the beautiful slide. But in, and you can also do this frozen section where they take the tissue, they put it in liquid nitrogen, so it freezes immediately. Then it's hard enough for that knife to cut it. You don't have to embed it in wax, so you can do it really quickly. All right, now cytology, the study of cells, um, is when you usually talk about cancer here, but it could be other issues with the cells. But um, yeah, when you take a sample, you can get a, we'll talk about the, the PAP test, uh, it's commonly used for, but you could uh, take some sputum, even urine, and you can look at the cells, some bone marrow, and, and tell if they, they, the cells are normal. Cancerous cells, you can see, I just thought this would be interesting for you guys. There's, they're not all normal size, they, they vary, they're weird looking, they often have big nuclei, um, and so, uh, trained pathologist um, can look at a tissue sample and look at the cells and say, oh, this is not normal. Yeah, you and I, well, maybe me will, you a little more than me, um, I can't really, you know, look at the cell until you've had a lot of training uh, um, to, to look at normal histology and look at pathological conditions. 
but a cytology sp uh, specimen is someone looking deep at the cells. I mean, histologically, you're looking at whole tissue, all the cells. Cytology, you're looking at individual cells, usually looking at unusual nuclei, unusual shapes, um, too many of the cells uh, than you expect. Yeah. And so here, it's looking at detecting cancer, you can take cells off the cervix and, and see what they look like. Yeah. And fine needle aspiration, again, using a small needle is, uh, is preferable to cutting out a big chunk, of course. All right, autopsies. I've been uh, lucky enough to know pathologists and, and seen an autopsy. Whether they're done or not is, depends on um, several things. Depends on the hospital's uh, protocols. Depends on resources, whether they can do autopsies. Depends on the, the patient's family wishes at times that comes into it. And whether it's a suspicious death, of course, sometimes that automatically flags it as getting an autopsy. So we don't autopsy all, all the dead. Sometimes people die in hospital and they go to the funeral home. But in some cases, autopsies will help us. They really help in education of medical students being able to do an autopsy. They help in us learning about disease. Uh, you get like COVID is a new disease and doing autopsies tells us, you know, what organs or the lungs look like. Is it affecting the kidneys and the brain? And so it gives us a lot of information. You know, autopsies need a professional pathologist. Um, and so they can't be done to everyone that dies in the U.S. But uh, we gain information by looking at the dead. Yeah. And when you do it, they, they have a whole chart. They take out organs out of the body, the liver, the brain. They weigh them and they can compare what's normal. So you can see, is it a large liver or is there, is there an issue like that? Yeah. Forensic pathology is a whole field looking at um, looking at pathology in terms of legal issues, right? Uh, is this an accidental death? Is it a suicide? Is it a homicide? And um, um, people that are forensic pathologists need to know a lot about the law as well, what procedures need to be followed um, to make sure justice is done. And you guys know your medical examiner coroner is often appointed or elected official. They don't have to be a doctor. It's, it's a strange situation. I'm not exactly sure what goes on there. But uh, if a, a real uh, pathology, a pathologist, a forensic pathologist, often in bigger cities and they'll, uh, to, to have an autopsy uh, done if it's, uh, there's some suspect uh, issue going on. All right, so clinical tests. When you see, you're going to send out a blood sample, a urine sample, um, so very common blood, but uh, they can look at. There's all kinds of subspecialties. People that look at the microbiology, what kind of you know bacteria in there, um, uh, uh, blood chemistry, all these things. So there's many many tests. Wonderful clinical pathologists give you readouts of what's going on inside the patient. So this shows a bunch uh, on the right. And so um, here you get a whole um, uh, chemistry panel of someone's blood. And you don't have to know these numbers, not now, not for me anyway, but you do need to know generally when you look at uh, different things like looking at sodium and potassium and calcium levels, there are certain ranges that are critical for life, right? And if you remember from A&P, what's low sodium called? Hyponatremia, right, or hypernatremia potassium hypokalemia, hyperkalemia. So all these things, you have narrow ranges of life. And if you go beyond that, you know, your heart's gonna stop, you're gonna have issues. And so when you see these out of whack, it doesn't necessarily tell you the disease really right away, those, these kind of things, but it tells you there's an issue and it gives you places to look. Is the kidney failing? What's going on here? Uh, glucose levels, I'm sure you're all familiar, those need to be within a range. If your glucose is too low, your hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic uh, is going to be evidence of uh, prediabetes or diabetes. And so too high or low blood sugar is going to cause you to pass out and either end and potentially kill you. So always look at glucose and you know, if people get older to see, you know, are you, are you diabetic? Um, let's see, NGGT. Yeah, things like this, ALT, AST are enzymes in the, in the liver, and the GGT is also uh, an enzyme in the liver involved in amino acids, changing them around. But these things, when you have high levels in the blood uh, sample, it's going to be indicative of some liver failure. 
something's going on. Uh, bilirubin too is part of you know is part of bile breakdown of red blood cells. So all these things, these uh, if you have the levels are off, is going to give you clues about liver function. What do you guys think? What organ we're talking about with uh, creatinine and uh, BUN is a blood urea nitrogen? Kidneys, kidneys. So these levels, these things should be removed by the kidneys. But if you start seeing uh, creatinine increasing in the uh, in the blood and other nitrogenous substances, that means hell, your kidneys are not taking care of it. There's probably a kidney failure. And the last ones, you should all recognize cholesterol and triglycerides. This is looking at lipid panel. There's like 600 kinds of lipids in the human body. And uh, LDL, HDL, those are high density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins. Uh, HDL is the good, good lipids and LDL is the bad. And you should, they look at that ratio and things are changing all the time. But um, looking at that is gonna tell you about the um, risk factors for atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. So they have statins and drugs that can help uh, reduce cholesterol levels in your blood. Um, yeah, so looking at these biochemical tests, so quickly you can scan these and you guys will these numbers i don't know if you learn those at some point are going to be uh critical and they change with the population males females and in the age and things like that and different conditions but these things are immediately you look through them and if you've got experience give you clues oh look high glucose you know are they, are they diabetic do they need their insulin uh, are they uh, fasting things like that yep so this chemistry panel uh, it varies, again, among racial groups, sex, uh, age, things like that. So um, these numbers aren't set in stone, but uh, they're critically important, just beautiful tools. You can, the, the lab will give you these and you can look at them right away. A urinalysis. Yeah, if you guys, uh, I took A&P with me, we did a, wow, this is a weird COVID year, but urinalysis uh, is uh, even easier to get than blood, just get a pee sample. And you want to get a midstream sample, which means uh, you want to pee a little bit, then capture the cup, because that first amount of urine will take out a lot of uh, microbes in the urethra, and et cetera. And so you want to get rid of that, and so you capture a clean urine sample. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can uh, use a uh, chemical strip. You can dip right in there, and you can get glucose and ketones and proteins and all these things. Uh, right away, or more detailed in our lab, we would have done a um, um, sediment analysis where we'll spin the urine and take a look at the crystals that'll be in there. Um, but urine, yeah, is there going to be bacteria? Do you have a UTI, a bacterial infection? Um, the uh, color, the gravity, specific gravity is how dense it is. It means you're are you dehydrated or not. Um, this is going to be if you have white blood cells and an infection, definitely protein. Proteinuria, having protein in your urine, you can have some if you exercise a lot or just normally, but um, if you have a lot of protein, it would be frothy, your urine, and it's going to be a sign of maybe kidney damage because protein shouldn't make it through that filtration membrane. If you have glucose in your urine, it means either you ate a whole lot of candy uh, or you're diabetic because glucose should be taken back by the kidneys. It's valuable. Uh, ketones are going to be a... Um, a sign of either fasting, you get ketones when you burn fatty acids, or diabetic, where you're burning fats because you can't bring glucose in because of insulin issues. Yeah, any bilirubin, you wanna look at uh, liver problems, hemoglobin, some kind of infection, you got blood in the urine, uh, uh, definitely bacteria, meaning an infection as well. So urine tests can tell you pretty quickly, you can look at glucose levels, you can look at whether there's protein and, and, uh, and, and tell some things right away from that. You can also use urinalysis to look for drug uh, metabolites, evidence of drugs and in pregnancy also, because placenta gives off um, a hormone when you're pregnant that can be found in your urine. All right, you're probably gonna want a CBC, complete blood count. Um, and that's where you take your blood and uh, they're gonna look for all kinds of things about your blood. Um, first of all, hematocrit, you guys should all know what hematocrit, hematocrit is where you're gonna look at a blood sample and it should be, about 50, 50, not 45, 55 of uh, red blood cells and plasma, red blood cells and plasma. 
So hematocrit is the percentage of your whole blood that is red blood cells. And if you are anemic, it means you have not enough red blood cells or not enough hemoglobin. If you are dehydrated, you're gonna have a high hematocrit because plasma is mostly water. So doing a hematocrit immediately tells uh, someone uh, what percentage of your blood is red blood cells and is there an issue? And then you can do a differential white blood cell count to look at all the different kinds of white blood cells. So your blood will give you clues about infections, about your body fighting them off. And if you have an acute um, bacterial infection, you have some kind of uh, cuts or some kind of, that, that's been infected, you have a lot of neutrophils. If you have a parasite, it's usually a lot of acinophils. Um, if you have a viral infection, there's a lot of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. So doing a differential white blood cell count gives you clues about disease. Again, it's one part of the puzzle, but it's a good clue. Your red blood cell count tells you how, if you're anemic or not. Yep. And if they're, these really good cells can tell you about the, the morphology, the anatomy of the blood cell. You know, how much hemoglobin does it have in it? Do you, you have an iron deficiency? Is it, how's the shape and the size? Is there leukemia evidence of that? You see a lot of immature red blood cells coming out. That means that you're producing a lot of blood cells. And maybe your spleen is enlarged. It means you're breaking down too many blood cells because it's enlarged. And so your bone marrow is making more blood cells. So there's a lot of information you can get. And then you can look at platelets to see if there's a clotting issue. And you know, either way it can kill you, clotting too much, clotting not enough. And there's other specif specific tests they do for clotting, a whole bunch of tests they do to, to look at clotting, because this is very critically important to a patient is that they have proper clotting. All right, transfusion medicine, obviously the people that are involved with blood banks and looking to make sure that, uh, and now there's, we learn the ABO blood type group, but there's actually all kinds of uh, subtleties. And besides the RH factors, all kinds of subtleties. Ideally, you wanna get your own blood if you could, you know, store blood and then get it. But um, uh, they're gonna look at, um, and also the safety of the blood, look at viruses and bacteria in the blood too. Uh, immunopathology is now looking at uh, antibodies. And that's being talked about now because of COVID to see when you are sick, your body uh, produces uh, antibodies and you have memory cells so that the next time you are infected, those memory cells are there. You can quickly fight the disease and you don't even, maybe not even have symptoms. So a vaccine will do that with a dead or weakened version of it, or the actual disease will cause that, that response as well, but you've got to go through the disease. Um, so looking at antibodies and if we see it in, in uh, COVID patients, if they have antibodies, it means that they've had the infection. But then, of course, you know, does that mean can they be infected again? So there's a lot of unknowns there. Yeah, the microbiology people, of course, are going to figure out, you know, what is the critter that's, uh, that's, that's causing the issue, you know, uh, usually bacteria and viruses. And the old way they would do it is you would uh, give a sample, a swab, and then they would try to grow it in various media, and they see how it reacted to various antibiotics. You can see these circles are impregnated with antibiotics. And uh, this zone of inhibition is where the bacteria can't grow because of the antibiotic. And this one, this antibiotic doesn't work very well. And this one works really well. So they can tell things. That's how they would narrow down which bacteria you had is could it grow in a certain media? And then how do antibiotics affect it? But now what they're doing is really just looking at the molecular, looking at the DNA. So they can just scan for the DNA. We know we have a bank of which bacteria, what their DNA segments are. And if we find it, it means you have it. So it's really going that direction. More rapid, more sensitive than growing it up in these, in these, these petri dishes and in these test tubes. So indeed, you know, the old way here looking at, let's look at the tissue sample. Uh, we want to look for cancer. Well, let's do a biopsy of the uh, prostate, we'll take a look at it, we'll stain it, we'll look at it. Now we're looking at, well, let's just get some cells, look for the, in this case, the proteins. And you do mass spec, you guys do chemistry, right? And uh, take a look at the proteins are there. And then there's a certain signature with certain cancers that we can develop this library and say, oh, instead of having to, all we need to do is get a blood sample and we can tell that it's there. 
And then uh, beautiful, these, 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 these chips with these arrays that we um, were able to take a sample of the uh, of blood, or it could be a, a biopsy, you take a sample, and to see if that um, the, the cancerous type, well, let's talk about a microbe, there's a particular microbe we're getting a sample of, and we, we could take that DNA and we can amplify it, do PCR to make many, many, many copies of it. And then on this, this, this microchip, we have all these wells, and it has the complementary strands of all these diseases that we know. So we run your sample, we wash it over there, and if you have the complementary part, if you have the disease in your body, that's going to be, has been amplified and it's going to wash over the dish and it's going to stick into the well that has the opposite, the anti-codon with the codon. It's going to stick to it. And if you wash it all away, um, it's also going to light. For us, it's just going to light up. It's going to show you which wells are lit up means that type of DNA was present in that sample. I don't know if I explained it very well, but it's just an ingenious way that we're able to screen for all these things just by looking at the DNA. We don't have to grow this bacteria in a culture. We just have to know because only the other bacteria, you've got, they've got that sequence of DNA and that's all you need to know. So this molecular diagnosis is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, we, we uh, um, be able to take the sample and just look for that DNA. What we're using it now in the Saco River, we just, you could take a sample of the river and like look at all the DNA and tell what organisms are in that water. You know, you don't even have to catch the thing. You just know it's there because it's got that unique DNA. You know, the work is making the library with each organism to see what their DNA looks like. And it's not all the DNA, it's just little pieces of it, but it's unique enough to tell you it's there. So uh, PCR is a way of making millions and millions of copies of just a small uh, sample of the DNA. And then you make a probe on the other hand, which has the complementary sequence, exact letters that match the DNA of that organism, and they're gonna stick. And if you make it fluorescent, so it lights up, then you wash, everything else is gonna wash away because it doesn't stick. The ones that stick are gonna light up like a Christmas tree. And it's gonna tell you, ah, oh, okay, they have this in a sample. So that's the, the basics behind this molecular diagnosis. And yeah, pharmacy, I, get, I mentioned, we're gonna see this in the future that uh, we were just so simple back now, back in the 2020, um, where we gave, a certain drug to a certain patient because they had certain symptoms and we figured out that this is the drug that will help. Well, it turns out everyone is different in how they, how they break down drugs um, and how the drugs affect them because of their different genetic makeup. And some people are, are rapid, they will rapidly uh, um, break down a drug and some people are slower at that. And so if you have a drug that's particularly toxic at high levels and you give it to a person that doesn't break down the drug very quickly, you could uh, cause a lot of side effects. So um, we're gonna figure out our pharmacy based on your specific genetic makeup. We can look quickly screen for certain enzymes that tell us how a drug is gonna be affected in your body and then give you different treatments that's individualized to you. So pharmacogenomics, fascinating. If you look at this uh, figure I have for you here, you can see now, you know, the treatment, look at that, 30% success rate. But if we can figure out what type you are and give you individualized medicine, you know, just much better outcome. So this is the future. Well, it's here, but widespread use will be the future. All right, and lastly, uh, public health laboratories are really the, um, we decided as a, as, a, as a nation that public health is important. And that's why we have people that screen our food, people that all of your water has been through waste has been through uh, testing that's done by the government. So, and then public health facilities, you know, and, and uh, people go there to, um, for healthcare that they, they, they can't go elsewhere even as well. But uh, the, these, the CDC is the mothership in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, that's, it's supposed to, today it has some issues with leadership, but I won't get into that. But um, this is uh, the people that are going to collect data from all over and they're going to, um, the best, you know, the best epidemiologists in the world will, will work there with the best computers and setups to um, take data from what's going on in the United States and the world and uh, make recommendations. So uh, 
public health people. Uh, they get called in when you know there's Ebola has discovered new things. Uh, these are the uh, the the experts. Hospitals will often be for profit. Now these people uh, have the uh, the notion of public health uh, as an exercise in itself. All right. Well, hopefully uh, you guys knew what an X-ray is, an MRI machine. You, uh, what comes out of blood tests, but hopefully I filled in some gaps for you and uh, uh, completed this. So. Now you have a big, big picture of um, um, a patient, what tools are available to us, what our goals should be. And uh, you know, we'll be able to use the rest of the, uh, the semester looking at the diseases you know, individually. But hopefully we set up some vocabulary and we set up some basics of what uh, tools we have to lead us to a diagnosis, to, to lead us to treatments. All right, thank you guys for listening.